Hello, everybody, and welcome into my latest live broadcast. It's Tuesday, the 13th of June, 2023. Remember that date because it's important. My name is Kerry Holzman, and today I've got something very, very cool to share with you. The good folks over at Minis Forum have sent me a computer that you can't buy yet. You can pre-order it. These won't ship until the end of June, and this is not like any of the others. You'll think it is until you look at the details. So we're going to talk about that today. Also, a shout out and a thank you to Mark Gaines, who contributed a $30 Amazon gift card prior to the show starting, and to Paul O'Brien, who contributed as well. Both of uh, these gentlemen are in Ireland. It's just a coincidence. Thank you to both Paul and to Mark for supporting the channel so we can remain sponsor free. The folks at Minis Forum are not paying me to make this video, nor am I making any commission on the sale if you choose to buy anything from them. They send me the unit for free and in exchange I review it on my terms, on my schedule, the way I want to review it, and they're cool with that. So my thanks to the folks at Minis Forum for letting me do it my way and uh, for sharing with us early looks at upcoming latest and greatest technology that they are innovating. Dave Davis Parsons has now been a member for 13 months. I just see here in the chat he says, I hope everything is okay. We have another round of hail storms in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Five-inch diameter hail. That's like baseball size. In some areas confirmed by NWS. Interesting. Wow. Wow. Stay safe out there and keep the car in the garage, I suppose. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I want to thank Phil over at Minis Forums because he's been such a pleasure to work with. And he's got another machine he's sending to us that's also a new machine that I can't wait to show you. And this Friday, you know, I like to save the biggest show, the most expensive show. <laughs> I don't know. The show I consider to be sort of a bigger deal, a bigger production for whatever reason, for Fridays. I always do a show Friday at 1 o'clock live, and it's going to be the Minis Forum NAD 9. That's a lot more expensive than this. It's a lot bigger than this. That'll be Friday. This is all about power and performance in the smallest package possible. You guys, when I saw this arrive, the first thing I thought of was that, uh, that little Chewy computer. That thing is just junk. It's slow. It's not even Windows 11 compliant, and they put Windows 11 on it. And look, I'm not here to to sit here and compare Minis Forum to all their competitors. And it's not my intention because it's kind of a low class thing to do. But I want you to know there's a lot of mini PC manufacturers out there and they're not all equal. My top five are gonna be Minis Forum right at the top, followed quickly behind by B-Link and then Ace Magician slash Cam Rui. That's not to say other than those three that the rest are junk or to be avoided. I'm just saying, in my personal opinion, those are my top three as far as uh, getting a machine where support may be limited due to the fact that these are all shipping from China. There's no sort of U.S. headquarters. If you want something with a U.S. headquarters, you definitely want to look at either the Intel Nook or the uh, Asus line of mini PCs. Again, my opinion. Oh, and I'll throw Geekcom. So I'm going to add Geekcom up to that top list as well. They're also a good alternative uh, to the Intel Nook if you want to save some money. But again, you might lose a little on support. I don't know yet. I haven't had enough experience with them. But you'll notice the first one I named, the very first one I named was Minis Forum. And why is that? If Minis Forum isn't paying me and they're sending me a PC for free to review, just like all the others I've mentioned, or in some cases, I buy them to review. What is it about Minis Forum that attracts me? Well, first and foremost, so far, we've never had a bad unit. Now, I can't say that <laughs> for nearly all the other manufacturers. I've, I haven't had a bad Nook unit, and I've only had one Asus unit. Okay, so the problem is when you get a bad unit, it, the, 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 the replacement process isn't the easiest, right? So if you order from Amazon and you can return within 30 days, you're gonna know right away if you've got a bad unit. And the reason the units can go bad is, is if they're really mishandled 
and shipping. You have no control over whether the package was handled with care by the shipper. It's no fault of the manufacturer in most cases. It's usually packed quite well. But for example, I was waiting on a package from DHL and DHL lost the package and gave up looking for it. They said, I don't know where it is. And then after they gave up and a claim was filed, the next day they magically found the package. So what misery did that package go through for the five weeks it was in transport? Oh, if only packages could talk. Now, I haven't even opened that package yet. Um, I haven't tried it because that's the NAD9 we're going to be reviewing on Friday. Here's hoping everything's going to be okay. I will also say that the NAD9, I ordered it as a bare bones. And that's so I could get it cheaper, which is still more than twice as much money as this. But that one, you have to add your own storage and add your own RAM and add your own operating system. And you don't have to, but they offer it that way. <clears throat> and I did that because I'm a tech and I'm going to save some money. And Minis Forum didn't have any more of those to send for review. So I said, you know what? You guys have been good to me. Uh, you support me. I'll support you back. And I think that's going to be a machine I personally use. But... Nonetheless, I, I digress. Mini's Forum has some of the most innovative designs I've seen from any of the mini PC manufacturers. Time and time again, they come out with these really cool, unique line of products that just are unlike anybody else in the market. So if we look at the NPB7 that I showcased, where you just tap on the lid and it opens and you have access to your, your RAM and your storage, or you look at that Nook i7X, which is that big, skinny, book-looking... It's like half a laptop, literally. <laughs> uh, they put a, basically a laptop motherboard without the monitor, without the battery, without the keyboard, without the tablet, with an RTX 3070 mobile graphics processor on board, just like a laptop. And you've got yourself one of the best, if not the best, mini PC gaming PCs ever. Like, I don't know anything that compares with that in video performance. And, you know, it's also big, but it's super skinny, and it just doesn't look like anything else you've ever seen. You know what? Let me just show you. Let me just show you what I'm talking about, because it's so cool. It is by far the coolest looking and best performing mini PC. Is it fair to call this a mini PC? I don't know. It's really neat. I was going to use this uh, off to the side, but it, it's... I wanted to show the skull, but I'll end up blocking the mini, the, the background if I do that. So I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to implement this in the studio, but I really want to. This thing is a beast. Now, granted, it's not perfect. I mean, I'd love to have more I.O. on it, but to be honest, it's not like it doesn't have a lot. It just, I don't know. It looks like it could use a few more USB ports, I suppose, if I had to complain about something. But... Uh, this thing is a monster. It's a beast, and it doesn't look like anything else out there. So when I talk about Minis Forum with such enthusiasm, it's because they really strike at what I find valuable, and that is stop making cookie-cutter PCs where they're all the same. If, if I'm a consumer and I'm looking at mini PCs, and all I'm doing is looking at specs and price, there's no emotion there. That's just, they're all basically the same. So which one's the cheapest? But if you can evoke an emotion, if you can offer me something in a shape or a design that also meets the specifications that I need, or as in the case of the Nook, it's called a Nook i7X, and they make a lower end version, the Nook i5X, also fantastic for, for gaming then I want it because of how it looks as well as its performance, and there's nothing to compare it to. If I want something like that, that is the only thing like that. Okay, so in much the same way, what I'm about to show you is unlike anything else on the market. Are you ready? Have I hyped this up enough? I've already taken it out of the box, so some of the wrapping's been removed, but I don't think unboxings are that exciting anyway. This right here, and I don't know if you can tell just how small that is. That's my bottle of Gatorade right next to it. It is ultra tiny. I'm going to bring it up to the camera so we can get a closer look. 
Now, traditionally, these ultra tiny machines are only good for streaming. They're, you know, under 200 bucks. Sometimes they're 100 bucks. They're very low power. They're going to be Celeron processors. They're going to be very weak and very slow, and you get what you pay for kind of a deal. However, this is not that. Okay, this is not that. This is a very respectable AMD Ryzen processor with RDNA 2 graphics. This is essentially, is it even fair to call this a mini PC anymore? This is like a ultra mini or super mini, teeny tiny, eeny weeny, micro PC. I don't know, I don't know where to draw the line. It's got two fans, one here on the top, one here on the bottom. Now, if I have a complaint about Mini Swarm, it's like they like to cover up the screws to get inside with the rubber feet. For the love of all that's holy, please let us get into the machines without having us remove the rubber feet. You know what? Drill a hole. Mold the rubber feet with a hole so I can put the screwdriver through there because the rubber feet never quite stick the same ever again. Now, I don't see any reason to be opening up this one. You're going to configure it with the amount of RAM you wanted, all right? There's, they don't sell a bare bones version of this. The RAM, I'm pretty sure the RAM is soldered on here. And that's actually better because it makes the machine cheaper. You're likely never going to have a RAM issue, but it does mean when you order it, make sure you order it with the amount of RAM you're going to want so that you don't regret it later. Um, the RAM also performs faster when it's soldered in versus socketed. Now, if we take a look, one thing that's missing on this mini PC as we kind of spin it around is you'll notice there is no Ethernet port. And I guess that makes sense. If you really wanted Ethernet, you can get a USB to Ethernet adapter and plug it into one of the three USB type A slots here, USB three type A. And then we've got a USB four in the back and a USB four here. Both of those will provide power output as well as video output combined with the HDMI port. That's your only video out except, except each of the USB 4s can also work as a video out. That means you can have three displays at 4K at 60 hertz operating on this. Little teeny, teeny tiny. I, what do I have to compare this with? Um, Let's go over here and step around behind the camera. This right here is a 1980s toy that's very famous even today called a Rubik's Cube. This is the mini PC. It's a little bit wider than a Rubik's Cube, but the Rubik's Cube's quite a bit taller. It's only the mini PC is about a mm, little over two cubes. Two of the little Rubik's squares tall. And it's about, let's see, that's three Rubik's squares. Oh, it's about five, a little under five Rubik's squares wide. How's that for a measurement? Let's see it again. They're very small, very small. But here's the thing. Wait till I plug this in and turn it on, and you see how much power and performance this has. It's going to blow your mind. And the fact that you can do gaming on this? Are you kidding me right now? Now, in the, in the box, there's a few things you get here. Let's get that out of here. Let's open up this. You don't get a lot. You get an HDMI cable. You get a USB Type-C to Type-C cable. What's that for? Finally, you get your power adapter. This power adapter, I'm going to walk it over to the camera so you can see, might look familiar to you. It's probably very similar to what you use to charge your phone. This is obviously the U.S. edition of the power adapter. And if you want to look real close, you can see what uh, the output is on this. I think this is a 65 watt, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so... One of those USB ports has got to be used for power. So I suppose that means, well, I, I don't know how we will run triple display now that I'm doing the math on that. Um, if we have to use one of the USB ports for power, I suppose you'd have to get like a USB 4 splitter, and then you could provide power. 
as well as video output, but they'd have to buy something to do that. So I guess that's still doable. Okay, so I just want to clarify that. I hadn't thought that one through all the way. So one end of this, just like plugging in your cell phone, plugs into the power adapter. We'll plug that in over here, and then the other end is going to plug into either of the USB 4 ports. So I'll use the one in the back. Is that the back? Which, which way is the back on this? I'm going to call the HDMI port the back because we have ports on the side. That way the power button's up on the front, and then there's nothing at all on this side. And I'm going to set this right here for now, and we're going to look at the specs together on this before I fire it up. I want to say thanks to Paul M, who's contributed $5 in Super Chat. He says, here's a small donation for the kitty. Hey, right on. Thank you. Thank you to Planet Cryos. Contributes $2. He says, good to see everyone and howdy. We'll have a video from Planet Cryos, two videos, coming up this weekend, I think. Maybe this weekend. I'll do one video part one, and then the other video part two. Thank you to Plant Kraus for sharing his videos with us. He puts a lot of time, money, and work into them, and they're very well done, and I hope you show him some love. <clears throat> I hope you subscribe to his YouTube channel. Darren Belmore contributes five... Uh, what is that? I can't tell what the... What is that symbol? Oh, it's a euro. Darren Belmore contributes five euro. I should be using this monitor, shouldn't I? He says, my temp is slowly increasing on my i9900K. Should I reapply the thermal compound? I wouldn't. Very rarely will thermal compound ever do anything. In fact, it could make your temps worse. You definitely want to get in there with a, with a blower and make sure you get all the dust out of the fins on the heat sink and uh, off of the fan. And beyond that, you might want to change your cooler if your cooler is inadequate. Likely is not your thermal compound. Don't recommend that. Now, if you're going to change the cooler, then yes, you're going to want to take off your thermal compound and reapply thermal compound with the new cooler install. But if you stay with the old cooler, in my experience, replacing the thermal compound, it will either leave things the same or make things worse in most cases. Of course, at the end of the day, it's your machine. Experiment, see what works for you, and let us know what you decide. Thank you for the contribution. Paul O'Brien contributes five euro. He says, here's to tonight's stream. Also have a Gatorade on standby to chill in case of unintentional comments raising my blood pressure. Hey, we don't need that. Alej Depeche says, maybe this is closer to the size of a hockey puck, as Lou Greenius says. Uh, it's about the same weight as a hockey puck. It's actually a pretty good example. It's a little taller than a hockey puck. Um, I've got a hockey puck over at Studio A. I don't have it here, but I could um, set beside it. But that's, that, yeah, that's a good example. It's a good one. Mark Leibowitz says, dang, I think I want one of those EM640s just because. Hold on, you're getting ahead of me. You're getting ahead of me. Joe Carender says, hello. Some folks are talking about pumps. Oh, wait a minute. Does he have an all-in-one cooler? If your cooler is an all-in-one cooler, um, the fluid starts to evaporate out of these coolers, and they start to gum up. So depending on who makes the cooler, I hadn't considered that that was an all-in-one cooler. If you have an all-in-one cooler and your system starting to run warmer, it's time to replace the all-in-one cooler. Now, whether if you go with an air cooler, you'll never have to replace the all-in-one ever again. If you go with a high-end expensive cooler, like you'll see I'm using the NZXT Z63 here, those coolers tend to have statistically a liker, a, a, likely a longer lifespan. That's a lot of words that begin with L. However, in general, three to five years is what you can expect out of an all-in-one cooler. If you go with an air tower cooler, uh, those run indefinitely. 
Darren Belmore with five euros says he's got the Hydro Series H100i Extreme Performance Liquid CPU Cooler. Again, thank you for the contribution and the answer, Darren. How old is that cooler? If it's over three years old, I would replace it. I am not a fan of Corsair's coolers. I've had to replace several of them. In fact, there's a couple of videos here. Uh, the Cosmos 2, I'm pretty sure that was a, a Corsair cooler. And uh, when I'm choosing a cooler for myself, if I want something that's got to last, me personally, and again, I'm not sponsored or paid to say this, I like NZXT's coolers. That being said, if you never want to deal with this again, because even if you go with NZXT, you're going to have to replace it within about three to five years. On average, some people get more than that. If you never want to deal with that again, get yourself a nice tower air cooler. Now, an i9-9900K can be very difficult to cool. You're going to need a large air cooler for that. And if you've got RGB, you're going to cover it all up. So like the Noxua DH15, something like that. But it's ugly, ugly, ugly. So if you want to keep the looks... Just put it in your head, replace that cooler every three to five years. Now, so far, we've had this cooler running now. We've got to be close to three years. It's three, maybe four years. So I'm expecting to get another year or two out of it. And if it goes beyond that, hey, icing on the cake. The other thing to consider is I very rarely turn this computer on except for broadcasting. So it doesn't have very many hours on it for the number of years old it is. But still, the fluid evaporates, and the lines can get clogged in the, the uh, uh, what's it called? The fin stack inside of the heat pump, of the, of the water pump. The heat pump. <laughs> you know who does great videos on this stuff? Greg Salazar. Check out some of Greg Salazar's videos where he opens up the pumps and inspects them. And uh, somebody else, uh, Gamers Nexus, will open up the pumps, and you can see just how much damage happens inside these all-in-one pumps because they're sealed. Uh, that being said, I will use other manufacturers of pumps to evaluate them. So on the big robot's foot computer, we have a Cougar pump. But that robot's foot computer's only been on about 30 hours in its whole life. So that pump is still, like, brand new. And it's refillable. It comes with extra fluid. Be Quiet also has a great series of reliable all-in-one coolers, but I just don't care for how they look. But that's just me personally. But if I want reliable, Be Quiet is up there, and uh, NZXT are the top two choices for me. Okay. Little squirrel moment. Sorry for the squirrel moment, guys. I want to get back to talking about this computer right here. Let's go take a look. Let's go take a look at, uh, oh, wait a minute, we're not done. Darren <laughs> contributes five euro again. The temps go from 30 to 40 degrees while idle. The computer isn't overheating, I'm just asking. Uh, the other thing I would do, Darren, is look for a BIOS update and check to see how much voltage is being fed to that CPU. Because sometimes if you recently in, uh, updated the BIOS, they could be feeding more voltage to the CPU, which could be causing the CPU to idle at a higher temperature. And that'll require some Google searching to figure out what your uh, CPU voltage should be and compare it to what your BIOS is setting it to. If you're not having any overheating problems, I would advise you to not look at your temps. I think it's, I mean, do you check your physical temperature on a regular, do you check it every day? Do you put a thermometer in your mouth or other places to see? Uh, I wonder what my temperature is. Is there anything else in life that you would monitor the temperature of. And I have to tell you, Darren, as a working computer technician in over 30 years in this business, I've only had a handful of computers in all those years that ever had problems with heat, maybe a half dozen. And I've worked on tens of thousands of computers. I think the obsession with heat is an unhealthy one. And if we can get you to find another focus for your mental energy that would be healthier, than the pursuit of creating an issue where there isn't one. I don't see any problem with it. Um, but a lot of times I've seen this happen for two reasons. If it's a liquid cooler, the liquid starts to degrade and evaporate and clog up the pump over years. And the second problem is uh, potentially that a BIOS update is putting too much voltage to the chip. 
in order to get more performance out of it. Because all the motherboard makers, you know, they want to say they're the fastest, the highest performing, and they do that by boosting up the voltage. And it, it you know, there's a whole, this has been going on for a couple of years now. So if it bothers you, replace the pump. If it's not a problem and you're just kind of curious, leave it alone. There's no problem to fix. There's nothing you need to do. And five euros from Darren again says the BIOS is up to date and everything is set for default. I don't know why I check the temps in hardware monitor. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know why you're checking the temps either. I think it's a waste of time. Uh, it's like people that like to run the resource monitor to see how many resources their game is using, but the resource monitor uses resources to run, leaving fewer resources to the game. So stop it. <laughs> you know, think about what you're doing. Um, if if I'm trying to evaluate uh, PCs, you know, is it ready to be delivered to the customer? That's the only time I will run a hardware monitor. So I want to see is this how is this PC going to run if I put it under a load? It passes all the tests. I can feel very confident when I pass it on to the customer. They're not going to have any heat-related problems. If a customer calls me and says their PC is shutting off randomly, I start thinking, well, they got a bad power supply. Maybe they got bad RAM, or maybe they're having an overheating problem. If they can turn the machine back on right away and it comes up, it's not a heat problem. If the machine has to sit a couple minutes before it'll come back on, it likely is a heat problem. I only run diagnostic software or monitoring software when there's something to fix. I don't run it just to run it. And I would hope you wouldn't run it just to run it. Find something else to do with your computer besides find something wrong with your computer. It's well within its normal operational range. I wouldn't give it a second thought unless you're having a problem. I think you're wasting time and you're wasting money. It's your time and it's your money. But would you take that to a shop to pay somebody to fix it? And if the answer is no, then you're not having a problem. <laughs> That's an easy way to tell. All right. All right. So thank you for all your contributions. I appreciate you and I appreciate your questions. But I do want to get back to this review. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that. <clears throat> and if you want to email me privately and further this discussion, you're always welcome to do that. Okay. All right. So as far as this uh, EM680, let me bring up the Minis Forum page. And I will share that page with you. <laughs> Window capture. There it is. Okay. Now the link to take you to this page is in the video description below the video. This is going to be a $499 computer, but it's available. Oh, yeah, this is the EM680. It's available for pre-sale at $399. It's a limited time discount. The EM680, that's the unit we're looking at, starts shipping later this month, in late June. You'll see they have adapter, power adapters only for the UK and the US. That's all they're offering at this time. And then we've got our product shots here. And if we scroll down, this is their Mercury series. They have Neptune series and, and other you know, planet-based series. And uh, the processor is an AMD Ryzen 7 6800U. It's an eight core processor. This machine is one 120th the size of a typical desktop computer. It uses something they called Cold Wave 2.0 cooling. And it's a combination of the dual fan design and liquid metal that has to be applied just right. Yes, they are using liquid metal as the thermal material on the CPU so you can get the best performance possible. Who else does that? Of course, we've, we've established just how tiny it is. Here's the performance of the 6800U versus its little brother, the 6600U. It's uh, significantly better performing and way better than that N5105. You'll see the RAM is soldered on here and they're using DDR5 RAM.
I'm a little confused here. It shows 4,800, but here they're saying 6,400. And then they're comparing it to 4,800 in RAM speed, showing it being 95% faster. It has a PCIe Gen 4 solid state drive already installed. It's a 2242 size. So it's gonna be about one third the size of the M.2 drives you normally are familiar with. Now, the, the SSD they're including cannot do 7,000 megabytes per second, but the plug they're plugging it into can. Just so you know, I'm not aware of a 2242 M.2 drive that can achieve 7,000 megabytes per second read speeds. But there could be one out there. There could be a few out there. I just, I haven't encountered one yet. So, but the, the Gen 4 spec has the potential to run over 7,000 megabytes per second. Whereas Gen 3 would only do 35, 3,600. A little bit more on the cooling. Again, they've showed the liquid metal here. TDP up to 28 watts, which means lower CPU temperatures. That means quieter fans. There's sort of the breakout or the exploded view of the cooling system and how that works. And as we continue scrolling down, a little benefit about the heat sink here and how it compares to a traditional. There's our two USB 4 supporting alternate modes. Whether you need to transfer large files or perform high speed backups, it can handle it with ease, with impressive efficiency and smooth entertainment experience. Oh, for sure. Here they've got an external GPU plugged into it for the ultimate gaming mini, ultra mini PC. You've got uh, 3.5 millimeter audio out. We've got a memory card reader that looks like micro SD. It says TF. I don't know what TF is, but that looks like micro SD to me. The USB ports, the type A ones that I pointed out, those are all USB 3.2 type A. And these USB Four ports, as I mentioned, will do power delivery, display port out, as well as data transfer. So they show it with three monitors here, but they don't show how it's being powered. <laughs> so again, I think some kind of a USB or hub would be needed that could accept the power input and still give you another USB 4 back. That's out of the box. You're not going to be able to do that. Um, Silent mode, lower noise, worry-free use. It's in your palm. Yeah, we got that. Everything in the box says it comes with a mounting screw set, but I didn't get any screws with mine, but I wouldn't use them anyway. But yeah, we got the PC, the adapter, the USB cable, the HDMI cable, and the user manual. I also want you to know that the online store, the Minis Forum online store, when you go up here to shop, you want to look at, you know, AMD-based mini PCs or Intel-based mini PCs. This shop has only been around three years. Although Minis Forum has been around longer than that, the shop kind of happened later on. As a result of that, the shop is having their third anniversary celebration. So it's, it's not Minis Forum's third anniversary. Minis Forum is older than that. But the Minis Forum store is celebrating the third anniversary. And if you click le learn more here, you can learn about the special they're running from, well, it starts today and it goes until the end of the month. And if you want to enter, it says if you order during this time period, You'll get six credits for every $1 spent. Customers who place orders during the sale are also eligible in the lucky draw to win a t-shirt or even a mini PC. And you receive an extended six month warranty by simply registering your product. So this is for people that are buying. And oh, I'm seeing things I like in here. <laughs> Look how thin that is. All right, I'm getting distracted again. Oh my gosh, look at all this minis for them. Goodness, there's my NPB7. Oh, I love that little computer. Okay, focus, Carrie, focus. This one's really neat. This has, this has a webcam built into it. So it's a mini PC that you can use in your office or for meetings where you don't have to worry about buying a separate camera. All right, but I'm getting distracted.
hold on. Let me, let me go back to camera one here. A link if you want to learn more about the anniversary uh, specials that are running is again in the video description below the video. Icaranis has now been a member for three months. He says, I'm not a fan of liquid metal. It seems a lot like the Terminator 1000. Um, well, first of all, thank you for being a member. Secondly, liquid metal has to be very carefully applied. And Minis Forum has developed their own process for applying the liquid metal. As a result, you don't want to be removing the cooler from the CPU without potentially having to completely reset all of that. And putting it on is very complex. So the benefit of having it is it's just a much better thermal conductor than uh, regular thermal paste. And it allows them to put a higher end CPU with smaller, quieter fans into a smaller package. I don't know that it could have been done any other way without, without the, the physical case being bigger for better airflow with bigger fans or louder fans. So nothing wrong with liquid metal as long as it's applied properly. Planet Cryos contributes $10 in Super Chat. He says, Carrie, thanks for all your videos, support, advice, and friendship. We should all be thankful. Okay, now back to the schedule program. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, did I, did I just turn into Elvis? Thank you very much. So there's two models of this. That's what I forgot to do. See, that's what happens when I get distracted. These are live videos. So, you know, viewer beware. Let me go back here again. Let's go back over to the to shop AMD Ryzen. And I want to show you what people were talking about here. Um... There's the EM680. Now the EM680 we have has 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gig of storage, but they also offer it with 32. Remember that RAM is soldered on. And there's a price difference of about 50 bucks, which is fair. So if you feel like you're gonna want 32, you better order it with 32, because whatever you get, it's gonna be that way forever. And then they also offer it with 32 with double the storage at one terabyte. And that adds another 30 bucks. I would definitely spend the extra 30. So at 489, that's a heck of a price when you just see how much computer you are getting. Um, back over to the, uh, let's go back over to the Minis Forum main page here. On their main page, they're gonna highlight their latest and greatest upcoming or just recently released builds as well as their popular picks. Uh, I have one of these HN263s coming, which is very similar to the NAD9, but a bit more affordable. We're going to talk about that. The UM790. This is a very interesting box uh, for the price and the specs. And of course, this pop-up here on the UM773 Lite, we already did a review on that if you're interested in that, sort of as a budget mini gaming PC. Uh, the UN100, I don't know anything about this one. I thought there was another, another version of this, but maybe I'm getting confused. I thought there was another version coming out. Was it an EM? I thought it was an EM780. Let me search and see. EM680. Yeah, there is an EM780 coming out, and that's going to even be more powerful. And they'll have a 780 and a 790 Pro, which I think are the same form factor, but with even more power using a Ryzen 7 7840U, which is even more powerful than this. Expect that to cost more money, but in the same package, that's pretty darn cool. And uh, yeah, that's, that's just at a press release point. There's not even a product yet. This one you can actually order and have it within a couple of weeks. And when the 780 and the 780 Pro come out, perhaps we'll, if you guys are interested and you want to see the, the big brother to this, uh, we can get one and review it. Let's go ahead and turn it on and see if it matches all the hype, because I've been hyping this thing up, right? So we got expectations set pretty high. Let me plug the keyboard and mouse into it. Uh, we'll just go right here. And then I need an HDMI cable. 
what else? I cannot plug it into the network. It has to be Wi-Fi only. And my solution for that, because I don't like to be on the Wi-Fi while I'm live, is I in this drawer over here, I have a few of these pretty inexpensive um, USB type A to Ethernet, and I can just plug that anywhere here. And then I can plug my internet in so I don't have to connect to Wi Fi. But I totally understand why they did not put an Ethernet jack on this, given its small size. And you'll see I'm using one, two, three, four of the ports, and that leaves me one USB 4 Type C up front and one USB type A in the back. So again, if I need to plug in a lot of things to this, uh, this may not be the best choice for you if you're gonna plug in a bunch of stuff. Um, do keep that in mind. The, the very nature of its size limits how many ports you can have. Where would you put them? You know what I mean? You could always buy a USB hub, but then things start getting ugly. You know, then you start getting into the bunch of spiders web cable nest to each his own, but I think for a PC this small, you really want to keep it minimal. This is what this is all about. This is a minimum PC. I think that's a good way to explain it, at least in size, but not in stature. Here, let me show you. Let's go over to my HDMI input, and I'll put myself in the corner like I always do. Get in the corner where you belong. Okay. And... Why don't you check out the boot time? Are you ready? Three, two, one, power up. I have a little teeny tiny hole that's an LED. I don't know if the camera's picking it up. That tells us that it's on. And this little teeny tiny PC that has always been... Oh, we're already up. I haven't even got finished my sentence. That's always been equated to cheap, minimal is a contradiction in itself in that it's minimal in its size, but it's maximal. Is that even a word? I'm gonna make a word, maximal, and what's inside. You know what this is? This is a TARDIS PC. This PC is bigger on the inside. <laughs> it is, let me show you. This, is, this blows my mind. You have no idea. Um, you should have seen the expression on my face when I got this, because I was like, oh no, Minisporum is going to make the cheap little microcomputers, and they're going to enter that marketplace, and they're all just blah. And I don't know, plug it in and see what it's like. And it was like, oh, hello. In fact, I showed my sister. I said, look at this computer Minisporum sent. She goes, oh. Yeah, I guess if you like slow, right? We're already judging the book by its cover. Well, this is far from slow. Check this out. Right, right click over on the start button, go to the system. Look at the specifications of this bad boy here. Ryzen 7, 6800U. Not a Ryzen 3, not a Ryzen 5. It's a Ryzen 7. Now this one is 16 gigs of RAM. I would prefer 32, but they sent it to me for free, so I'm going to take what I can get and say thank you. But if I was going to order one of these, I would definitely get the 16, uh, I would definitely get the 32 gigs of RAM and the one terabyte of storage, and that way I wouldn't have to open it up to upgrade the storage. And as I mentioned, whatever RAM you get, that's the RAM you have for life on that unit. It came preloaded with Windows 11 Pro, and it was 22H2, thank goodness. And it didn't require me to do the user bypass for creating a Microsoft online account. It let me create an offline account right out of the box. So they did that right as well. When I ran Crystal Dismark on the internal storage, uh, let's open it with paint. The numbers we got right here, 4960 and 2734 on the rights. Now, I'm not quite sure what the fastest 2242 M.2 drive is. So I don't really know what to make of this, if this is good or not. We know that the port has the ability to go to 7300. 
on both reads and writes. But it's awfully demanding to ask of a, of a 2242 M.2 drive. Like, I don't know if you know just how small that is, but if I go full screen on camera one, I'm, I'll give you a comparison because I happen to have one right over here. And you don't see me use these much because generally they don't perform as well because of the size limitation they have. But um, let's see. Yeah, here, this will work. So just neither one of these drives is included, but these are just examples of a uh, typical M.2 drive. Now, as you can understand, it would be very difficult to put this in here, given that it's, it's, it's longer than the, <laughs> than the case. Certainly couldn't go in that way, right? That's not going to work. Yeah, it is, it's just a little bit longer than the case, and you'd need it even longer than that to make room for the socket and the motherboard for that to plug into. Okay, so this is a 2242. So it's got, it's essentially the same as this, only it's half the size, a little over half the size. 2280, 22 millimeters wide, 80 millimeters long. 2242 is 22 millimeters wide. 42 millimeters. Last I checked, 42 is just about half of 80. And as you can imagine, you can't put as many chips on here. So this is basically the size M.2 that's in there. So I would just order the unit with the 32 gigs of RAM and the one terabyte drive and be done with it. Uh, the difference you're going to see in performance going from, say, 4,000 to 7,000. Actually, it was closer to 5,000. That'd be about a 30% improvement in your I.O. Whether or not that's important to you kind of depends on how you're going to use the machine. Obviously, it would make a difference in your game loading times if you're a gamer. But uh, that's what a 2280 versus a 2242 M.2 NVMe drive look like. They're the same exact thing. One's longer than the other one, or one's shorter than the other one, depending on how you see, how you, how you look at it. Oh, is it a 2230? Is it my bad? It's not a 2242, but a 2230? Old man said it took 11 seconds to boot. Oystein, Oystein watching us all the way from Norway. Oystein says, wow, that boot up was super fast. Steve Mercure said, what was that, like 10 seconds from the button push? It's insane. All right, this little tiny computer. All right, let, let's... Let's do that again. Let me um, let me put myself back in the corner. Did this go to sleep on me? Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Did I hit the power button when I picked it up? Yes, I did. <laughs> I'm such, you know, I grab technology. I don't handle it with kid gloves on. You know, I grab it and I, I don't, I'm not tough with it, but I'm also not gentle with it. And so... I guess when I picked this up, I hit the power button and I shut it off. So let's turn it on and you can time the boot up again. You ready? Three, two, one, on. Okay, there it goes. In just a minute, we get, there it is, our power on self-test. And then we'll boot right back into Windows here in just, what is it, about 10 seconds. Now. Can you understand why I am so excited about this? Oh, I've got updates installing. That's not fair. You, we're going to have to start over again. That's not fair. Let's do this. Let me go over to full screen on my side of things. Let me show you how fast it shuts down. How about we start there? So we'll go to start and shut down. Three, two, oh, it's off. Wait, what? Okay, let's turn it back on. That was crazy. All right, three, two, one, on. All right, now, 
We still have 10 seconds. There's our post. And <laughs> we're here. It's crazy. All right, so look, there are a couple of other very excellent reviews that run some games through this. But you know, there's like 10,000 games or more out there. And I don't know what the statistical likelihood of them playing a game that you're gonna play as well on this machine. And that's why I think those reviews are kind of a waste of time because unless they're showing the game that you play, uh, it's kind of difficult to gauge how well it's gonna play the game. But you can always, as I previously mentioned, get an external GPU, plug it into the USB 4 port, and you're off to the races as far as playing any game you want at much higher resolutions. But this is no slouch. And that's the thing I want to make clear. In and of it by itself, you can play uh, most games without a problem, with a few exceptions if they're super, super high end. And you may have to lower resolution or settings down. But this uh, GPU that's in here, so let's go to the device manager real quick. Let's take a look in here. Under display, you'll see we've got the 80, uh, AMD Radeon graphics. And this one is the, uh, I was gonna tell me in here, hold on. Let's go down here. Uh, where will I find it? Let's do control out delete. I suppose I have to turn my keyboard on. Control out delete, task manager. Let's go to performance. Under the GPU. So give me the model. It just says Radeon. I guess I got to look back at the spec sheet to figure out. Hold on a second here. This is it should be in my own video notes. Uh, 680M integrated GPU, 680M. And uh, that there's a, a 700 series of RDNA 3 graphics that has just come out or is coming out as we speak. So this is right there, what is essentially the latest and greatest, but within days, there'll be a, a newer, faster chip out. But that also comes with uh, typical teething problems with new technology. So this is sort of the, the top tier of the RDNA 2 onboard graphics. And it's, it's absolutely not a slouch at all. And again, depending on the kind of games you play, uh, I think you'll find for its size, it's mind blowing how good it, it, it uh, performs. So let me go back now to let's see, Darren Belmore contributes five euro. Can we call on Messenger? I prefer chatting than emailing once you're finished broadcasting. I prefer not to do that. And the reason for that is I'm on camera quite often. And the last thing I want to do when I get off camera is to get back on camera. Um, that being said, you know, you can talk in Facebook Messenger and send that as your message, and I will type back to you. I'm okay with that. But, uh, yeah, I don't want to go on camera after I just got off camera. I hope you understand that. But you can feel free to talk and then send that in Facebook Messenger, and I'll hear it, and then I will type back my response. Okay, so, uh, and thank you, Darren. Thank you for all your contributions today. Matthias says, can you please try another USB power supply? Uh, I'm trying to think if I have another USB power supply, USB-C power supply, that would be powerful enough. Um, my cell phone charger isn't going to be powerful enough, but uh, 
my Samsung Galaxy Book 3 is like a 135 watt USB-C charger. We can grab that one. And this should be way more power than it needs. So I, I don't know why you'd want to do this, but the benefit of USB-C is that as long as your charger has the bare minimum amount of power or more, it's going to work just fine. So if we shut this back down, let me go back over full screen so I can see this again. We'll shut this down. Okay. And we're going to take the power supply it came with and we'll put it way over here so you know there's no camera trickery. This is the USB Type-C power that came with my Galaxy Book 3, which was $3,000, all right? Not, I mean, for you know, a laptop. I could buy many of these. I could buy about six of these and still have money to go out for a nice dinner afterwards. And now let's turn it on. And we should get a post screen. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's the beauty of USB. So just got to make sure if you're going to use a different power adapter, uh, it's got to be at least, I think it's got to be at least 65 watts. This one is, uh, text is so tiny. Maybe if I take a picture of it with my phone, then I can blow the picture up. I should try that. Let's see. It's a 65 watt maximum coming out of this. And it'll output five volts at three amps or 9.9, .9, nine volts at three amps. I'm not quite sure why there's two ratings here. Yeah, but the power output on this is 65 watts. So you'll need a 65 watt USB charger or adapter or greater. Like I said, this one I think is 135 watts, if I'm not mistaken. So as long as the number's bigger, you're fine. You know, 65 or bigger. Other questions I can answer for you? I was looking to see if I missed any other messages. Um, yeah, but what else would you like to know about this? As I mentioned, you can see the different uh, like Cinebench and stuff like that being run by other channels. They all kind of do the same thing. Uh, very few of them cover the information I cover. And I think between myself and the other folks that are doing these reviews, you should get a nice complete picture of what to expect. Uh, ETA Prime has done a great video on this, and um, we go to YouTube and type in EM680 and push enter. ETA Prime has two videos on this, one about gaming. They just published that yesterday, and then one in overview of the system they did six days ago. And, and then there's me. Maybe we're the only two guys that have done it so far. I thought there was, thought there was still one more, at least in English. Well, I'm sure there's going to be more coming soon. Looks like the Tech Legends Knicks also have a review on it as well. Oh, I've never heard of them. 
But uh, ETA Prime does a great job with their reviews. I, he never shows his face, which I'm not a fan of. I was very, very skeptical of a content creator that won't show their face. But the information is, is valid nonetheless. And since he's already done all of that, I don't see any reason for me to replicate it. But I'm happy to take any questions you have about it. Steve H. contributes $10. He says, Carrie, I have a Minis Forum GK41 Intel J4125. That's a pretty low-end machine. It's got 8 gigs of RAM, 128 gig M.2 SSD. I won it via a local auction a couple of years ago. It had Windows 10 Pro. I upgraded it to Windows 11 Pro, Linux, and back to Windows 11 Pro. It's a nice little machine. Yeah, and that's really low end, you know, those J processors. Uh, these, you can put Linux on these, by the way, and I think ETA Prime did that, if I'm not mistaken. So if you want to make a streaming box out of it, but it's way overkill for a streaming box, I just have to say. Um, that out. Brush this page. But thank you as well uh, for your comments and your contributions, Steve H. Jen English says, hey, remember it's speedy now, but when you would start installing software like Lightroom, Photoshop, Office, it will be slower as any PC does. But Office really doesn't do much as far as performance degradation, but certainly Photoshop and Lightroom. This PC will do those things, but you would be way better off with a $3,000 computer to do that kind of work and that kind of software if you want something responsive and quick. This is not ideally tuned to be a content creation machine, but you still could use it as that, and it would be decent. It's just that there's a reason why the streaming computer back here is as big as it is, and that I'm not streaming off of one of these. I could, but it's not really what it's designed for. And I want to remind you, all of you, don't buy a screwdriver and use it like a hammer. If you buy the computer that is designed to do what you need it to do, then you're going to have a better overall experience of ownership. What I'm seeing on the internet, and it absolutely drives me crazy, is I'm seeing people trying to take something, the equivalent of a screwdriver, and then trying to modify it to use it as a hammer because they don't want to spend the money that a hammer costs when they can get a screwdriver so much cheaper. A screwdriver, no matter what you do to it, will never be a hammer. You'd be much better off buying the right tool. And I am a big fanatic on this because if I went to the hospital, I think you'll agree with me here. And the surgeon was boasting on, uh, he only has three surgical instruments and he can modify them as needed to do your surgery. Are you going to let that surgeon operate on you? Because I'm not. If you go into a surgery, you will see stacks and stacks of forceps and different kinds of scalpels, and shapes and sizes. And I mean, lots of them. If you're tinkering around just for fun, have fun, okay? But you will likely never have a good overall experience with the product if you don't use it in the way it was designed to be used. This is not a Photoshop slash Lightroom intended computer. Yes, it will do it. But you and I both know that level of a software is very, very resource intensive and would likely do far, far greater with its own dedicated GPU, a lot more RAM, a lot more storage, and a lot more processing power. So it's, it's sort of like you're buying the cheapest car you can buy, and then you want to use it to tow a yacht. It's preposterous, and I'm sorry I cannot get behind that mentality. I think the people that do this think they're being clever when I think they're being cheap or... They have a lot of time on their hands. So it's difficult for me to get behind the understanding of the logic that goes on there, think, thinking you're getting away with something. If you were just using uh, Lightroom or Photoshop or something like that, occasionally, this machine's fine. But if you're doing it on a regular, you know, 
multiple hours a day, again, this machine will do it. But there are better machines out there for that. And I would encourage you to buy the machine that's right for you. When you go to the grocery store and you look down the cereal aisle, at least here in the United States, the entire aisle is cereal from one end to the other. Every type and flavor, and, you know, every one of those cereals is somebody's favorite. To buy a cereal you don't like and then buy a bunch of other things to add sugar to it or add other seasonings and flavorings to make it palatable for your palate will end up taking more time and costing you more money than just buying the brand you like. So again, I would encourage you, do not buy a screwdriver when what you want is a hammer. And I think you will be a very happy customer if you actually buy something and use it the way it's intended to be used. So for whatever reason, this seems to exist primarily in the world of PCs. I don't necessarily see this in other areas of life that I can think of, but uh, set your expectations accordingly. If you buy something and use it in a way it wasn't intended to be used and your experience with it is less than thrilling, less than pleasing, if you end up with frustration, if you end up with uh, a lack of reliability or the machine gets really loud or it's really slow because you're using it in a way it wasn't designed to be used, that's not on the machine. That's on you. That's a user problem. So I encourage you to look at the variety of PCs that are out there no differently than you look at the variety of cereal available down the cereal aisle at the grocery store and pick the one that's most appropriate for you, first and foremost, rather than buying the cheapest one you can get and then trying to make it as good or as appealing as the one you really like. It's just some advice, take it or leave it. But I'd like to see you be happy. And uh, using the wrong tool and, and fudging it to try and make it right isn't something that will fly for me in a lot of careers. I don't, I don't want my lawyer coming up with some other tools. <laughs> They're not as effective as, as uh, the normal tools that lawyers use for, with regards to books and resources. I don't want my construction worker building my house to try and take a tool he's got and make it work for something I'm going to own and rely on and live inside of for shelter, for safety. It's just not a place to cut corners, guys. So. If a computer is a novelty for you, if it's a toy, then obviously you shouldn't be too upset if you buy something and find it doesn't work well in the way that you're using it. And you should expect that because that's what comes in that territory. But for the rest of us, for the vast majority of people out there, please know that every computer that exists, every CPU, regardless of Ryzen 3, Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7, Ryzen 9, Intel's, you know, N series, their i3, i5, i7, i9, those, just like the cereal aisle, are somebody's favorite. So to each their own, and we got to love the freedom. If you don't like freedom, if you want all your decisions made for you, there is a computer company called Apple, and you would be better aligned, and this is not sarcasm, I'm being 100% sincere. If you want your choices limited because you're overwhelmed by the number of choices, Apple makes all the decisions for you and you're the same as everybody else. You will not have a unique Apple computer. There is no such thing. And you will pay top dollar for it. You will get excellent support, generally speaking, and you will get the same as everybody else gets in that model and you will pay the same price everybody else pays. And if that sounds appealing to you, you should not be using a PC. You should switch to Apple. That's what people like about it. If you're somebody like me and you appreciate freedom, you appreciate choice, you appreciate a, a market that uh, competitors can now compete against each other on price, you have more choices, you have more freedom, you have the ability to express yourself uniquely 
the world of PC is for you. Apple doesn't have any competitors because if you come out with an Apple compatible computer, you're going to get the pants suit off of you. If you want to look up Franklin Computer Company and learn what happened to them, and if Apple has no competitors, then Apple can charge whatever they want. You can buy this at this price or you can go somewhere else. The benefit to that is you don't have any decisions to make, right? You don't have to decide which necessarily which processor you want. Yes, you can identify or change the amount of RAM or storage, but other than that, within a certain model line, you get the same thing at the same price everybody gets. That is the Apple way. And I hate that. I hate it. I despise that company. So to take advantage of the, the freedom of choice is to embrace that freedom of choice, not to abuse it and try and do something more with something than it was designed to do. Not to complain that there's too many choices and I can't make a decision because you're just not getting it. And that's okay. That's why Apple exists and that's why Apple is as big as they are. A lot of people prefer to not do any research, to not care. They can't be bothered. Just sell me this thing that'll do what I need it to do. They pay top dollar. You're not bargain shopping when you're buying Apple. And when you get it home, generally Apple owners are very happy with their purchase for many, for, for, they're very loyal. They can be happy forever with their Apple purchase and keep going back and buying more and more. But you can't have it both ways. You cannot have the decisions being made for you and your choices limited and at the same time have a competitive marketplace where you have choices of price. You've got to pick one or the other, and you've got to be realistic in understanding the consequences of your decision so that you don't end up having buyer's remorse or being disappointed with your choice. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing if it's embraced. And it's what draws me into this business. This is why you see me working on PCs. You don't see me working on Apple. Never, not once, never going to happen. It will never, ever happen. All right. Oh, Alan Lindus is taking off. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us today, Alan. Old Man 55 said, I occasionally convert DVDs to MP4s. I wonder if the Ryzen chip would be good enough. Man, the Ryzen chip can do that. Well, it's idling for crying out loud. That's not a big deal. You can take a USB DVD drive and plug it into the USB port, and you can rip that DVD likely faster than the computer you're using now to do it. Yeah. Oh, it'll handle that with no problem. No big deal. David Graham says it's getting close to his dinner time, so he's tapping out. Hey, David, thanks again for hanging out with us today. <laughs> Starshine said we have here we have entire rows of crisps crisps have so much retail space so that's potato chips for us Americans uh, I, uh, that's like me going to church if I went down an aisle of nothing but potato chips <laughs> Oh, I hear, hear the angels singing. <laughs> and I would be looking at everything up and down and left and right and turn around and, oh, give me the one of those and give me one of these. Oh, I'm in heaven if I'm in the chip aisle or the crisp aisle. Yeah. Never mind the cookies and the crackers or the, the biscuits. Give me the crisps. And give me a lot of choice. Gil Garcia says ETA Prime is going to make a video about running Linux on, on their streaming box in the coming weeks. Yeah, so ETA Prime is a great channel for reviews of other mini PCs. I absolutely recommend them. I just wish the guy would show his face. Davis Parsons said, I just ordered two of the little boxes.
Mark Leibowitz said, I sold a B-Link SER6 with an AMD Ryzen 7 7735HS CPU and Radeon 680M graphics to a client. It's quite impressive. Yeah, it's, it sounds like it's got very similar specs to this unit here. He says, but it's not as tiny as that Minis Forum EM680. Well, again, this, this isn't even officially out yet. This is available for pre-order, and they're shipping these at the end of June, whereas the, uh, the B-Link, that, that unit's been out for a couple months. And, you know, this industry moves quick. Oystein says he has a Minis Forum UM690 mini PC. He likes it very much. He says, but it does become hot when pushing it. Well, hot is okay as long as it's not overheating. Overheating is bad, but as long as it's staying within its operational temperature range, then I would say it's doing exactly what it's going to do, what it's supposed to do. And if... Uh, If you want something to run cooler, you need to put it, you know, if you're going to push it that hard and it's running hot all the time and it's bothering you, then likely a mini PC is not ideal for that use case scenario. But as long as it's not overheating and crashing, warm is acceptable. That's perfectly acceptable for it to get warm. It's what it's designed to do. Troll McTrollington contributes 10 Canadian dollars. He says, out of personal experience dealing with the screwdriver slash hammer people, it's like turning a Chromebook into a Windows 10 operating system. I laugh every time I see it fail. <laughs> you don't want to do that. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I actually have things to accomplish and not just go walking around in circles. Some people, some people just, I don't know. They just got too much time on their hands. And I, that's fine. It's just that when they, when they complain about it, that's what gets under my skin. Hey, I bought one of these things and I used it in a way that it was never supposed to be used. And it's not working well, so I'll never buy that again because it's a piece of junk. It's like, no, it's not a piece of junk. You bought the wrong thing. Of course, if you would have bought, bought the right thing, you wouldn't be having these frustrations. But if what you did was you were trying to get away like you thought there was a loophole you were sneaking through and outsmarting everybody, you're not. <laughs> but if you get entertainment or enjoyment from it, have at it. But if you get frustrated and angry, stop it because it's not its fault. It's the user's fault for having unrealistic expectations. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, scroll, scroll, scroll. Shamim says, hello, Carrie and chat. Regarding choices, sometimes it can be so difficult and stressing for choosing a part, like a PC case. There's so many choices that you can become crazy with the variety. Yeah, I disagree. The more choices I have, the happier I am. But there is, in the consumer space, when you're selling things to consumers, uh, there is something called analysis paralysis. And that's when you offer a customer too many choices and the customer cannot make a decision. So for example, if you go into Costco, which is a membership uh, warehouse club, you don't get many choices of items. They have this or nothing in a certain category. Or they may have a category that has two or three items, but even that's pretty rare. So if you're looking for Advil, there's one size bottle, that's it. You either buy that or you don't buy Advil. If you're looking for the energy drinks, they have regular and extra strength on the little energy shots. That's it. It's, that's it. Folks that run Costco will tell you that this is an incentive to shop there because they're removing the burden of making a decision from the consumer. And so the consumer then is able to have a less sh stressful shopping experience. When Fry's Electronics, remember Fry's Electronics? When they opened here in Phoenix, I was working at Best Buy, and the folks at Best Buy said, we're not worried about any competition from Fry's Electronics. We believe that Fry's Electronics offers the consumer too many televisions, for example. They just offer too much. 
And because they offer so many different televisions, the customer is more likely going to walk out without a television because they can't make up their mind. And they'll probably come here to Best Buy and buy a television instead. Of course, Best Buy is still in business today. Rise Electronics went out of business a long, long time ago. So, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't Fry's Electronics. It was Incredible Universe. When Incredible Universe opened, they were offering too many choices. And it was paralysis announced. That's when I was first introduced to that term. And I'll be darned if they weren't exactly right. So I don't represent a typical consumer. I like to have choices. And I like to look at the price, the warranty, the specifications, the weight, the size whether it's a television, a washer, a dryer, a stove top, I want choices. I want to see the color, I want to see its features, and I want to determine which one is the best value, not which one is the cheapest. I want to know which one gives me everything I want at the lowest possible price. And I can only do that if I have a big selection. So that's why if I walk into a Home Depot or a Lowe's looking at appliances, I often won't make a purchase because they don't have enough selection for me to pick from. Instead, I will look at homedepot.com or lowes.com, and then you'll see way more inventory than what the stores have. So usually I'll look online first, and then I'll go to the local brick and mortar store and see if they have it in person so I can see it in person. So for me personally, bring on the choice. And then uh, we, you know, we have a, a chain of restaurants here called In-N-Out Burger. And you pretty much can get a burger or a burger. That's more or less all they have. Burger, fries, and a drink or a shake. And then we've got Cane's Chicken Fingers. And you can have anything you want on the menu as long as it's chicken fingers. Chicken fingers, French fries, Texas toast, coleslaw. That's the entire menu along with a soda. That's it. That's all they do. So if I want chicken fingers, I know to go to Cane's. If I want a burger, I know I'm not going to get that at Cane's. <laughs> and I'm not going to get chicken fingers at In-N-Out. You do one thing and do it well. I want to see why my phone beeped at me here. Oh, okay. The mail's been delivered. That's what that was all about. Paul O'Brien contributes two euro. He says, I have to go. The dogs are annoying me. It's time for a walk. See you later. All right, Paul, thanks for hanging out with us today. Oh, enjoy your walk. Log Home was asking about the EQ12 from B-Link that I killed it. Um, was it the 32 gigs of RAM that killed the EQ? I think what happened was the RAM socket is very, very tight. It's, it's tighter than any RAM socket I've ever seen before. And I don't think I had the RAM module fully inserted. And as a result, I think it shorted it out. Because to get that RAM module seated in that EQ12 required quite a bit of force to get it seated. Furthermore, a little more research showed that the CPU was limited by the RAM anyway. So it wasn't going to get me anywhere. But it shouldn't have killed the PC. The, just changing the RAM out won't kill a PC. But if you short it out in the process of replacing it, that's why I tell people when they say, oh, it's no big deal to just change a thermal compound. Mistakes happen. Stupid little mistakes. And now you fried your computer over something simple that somebody online convinced you to do that likely was a waste of time anyway. And now you have a computer that was working but you didn't like the temps, and now you've made it into a computer that doesn't work and you're gonna spend several hundred dollars to get it fixed. So, yeah, it's not that the RAM module killed it, but the RAM module killed it. It was me that I killed it, let's be very clear. It wasn't the RAM module's fault, it was my fault. 
I didn't, I'm pretty sure I didn't have it fully seated because that ram really takes a lot of force to get it seated fully into the socket. And I've never experienced that before. And I only realized it after investigating that a bit further. So, yeah. And then also investigating that it wouldn't have benefited me anyway because the CPU was RAM limited. That's the other thing about these bargain basement machines is they can have uh, technical limitations engineered right into the chip. Meaning even if the RAM were socketed, that there would be no benefit to replacing it. It's something as simple as replacing RAM could end up killing a computer. So before the computer was too slow, so you tried to upgrade it. Now the computer doesn't work at all. It won't even power up. I'd say that's, you've made it slower. <laughs> at least it was usable before. And you know, if it had soldered on RAM, it wouldn't have been a temptation. <laughs> Once it's maxed out, you know, that EQ12, you can't go any higher than that. What's the point of making it socketable? It doesn't make any sense. Would have been cheaper for them to solder the RAM on and it would have removed that temptation for me to try to upgrade it. Everybody's talking about Five Guys Burgers and Fries in the chat. Yeah, but they're so expensive. You know, for me to eat there, it's like $20 to get a burger, fries, and a drink. And of course, they give you a small fry. I'll feed three people. So, yeah, I don't, I don't frequent that place very often. I, I got a close escrow on my meal. So pricey. But it's very fresh and it's good. But very expensive. But I hear it pays well to work there. Feral Terminator says, I know soldered RAM is cheaper, but the nerd in me hates not having DIMMs. Not only is soldered RAM cheaper, it's faster and it's more reliable. It's far superior. You have to understand the memory timing and how important it is. And the more DIMM sockets you have, the slower your memory is going to go. And each lane of data has to be the same length. So if you've got a socket that's really close to the CPU like that, and you've got another socket that's this far away from the CPU. Then you have to artificially extend the, the trace route of the, uh, the trace on the circuit board going from the RAM to the CPU. You've got to double the short one's length so it's the same length as the long one. You throw the timing off, it's not going to work. It's going to crash. It's really complex. It's really, really complicated. And putting soldered RAM on makes this far more efficient, far more reliable. We're getting to a point of diminishing returns anyway. At this point now, if you have 64 gigs of RAM in your system, I, it would be very hard pressed to find anybody who, who's really even using more than 32 gigs. So anything that comes with 32 gigs today is ideal for most people for today's use. And if you could get to 64, that's ideal for not only today, but for the years ahead. So people that go to 128 or anything over 64, they must have a very unique use case scenario where they just have money to burn. So if, if 64 gigs is going to do me good for the next four to eight years, why not just solder it off? Because I'll be replacing the PC by the time 64 gigs isn't enough. Because by then, it, it'll be more than just upgrading the RAM. I'll need a newer CPU, a newer chipset, probably faster storage. So as computers, the hardware is evolving, it's really surpassing the needs of the software. And it's getting so affordable that we can get that high end and just put the highest in there right out of the gate, solder it in, and you're good for the life of that machine. And so when that's not enough, the machine's at its end of life anyway. Think about it. It'll save you money be more reliable, and it'll be faster. John Williams wants to know, what happens if one of the soldered RAM chips fail? Will it still fire up or boot? Well, John, I've never seen a soldered on RAM chip fail. I've never seen that happen. It is extraordinarily unlikely. But because 
that question is sort of like asking, if I get my car into an accident, will I still be able to drive it? How would you answer that question, John? Probably you'd say it depends on the severity of the impact as well as where the impact occurred. And I would say the same with any part failure, whether it's a bicycle or a ram chip, depending on where the failure is and what kind of failure it is and how severe this failure is, will determine how the machine will or will not function from that point forward. Generally speaking, any failure is unacceptable regardless. Michael Mariello says, thanks for another great lesson. Right on, Michael, thanks for joining us today. Barrel Terminator said, I've never seen a stick of RAM fail after I put it in. Well, my guess is you haven't put a lot of RAM in. I have put in tens of thousands of sticks of RAM over the last 30 years. And it does, over time, it does and can fail. I've certainly had RAM working for a while, and then all of a sudden the computer's crashing, come to find out it's a bad RAM module. And who knows why it has no idea. It just happens. And I can't be bothered to spend the time to do uh, forensic engineering, to reverse engineer and figure out what failed because it's probably a unique failure that will likely never happen ever again. And the next failure will also be a unique failure that likely will never happen again. So unless I see a series of failures happening within a certain relative close time period, I can't be bothered to take any time to investigate it any further than repairing it or uh, replacing it and moving on and helping the next customer. But yeah, most of you are home users. You probably have had the number of computer in your lifetime that I deal with in a week here. So the scale of my operation is much, much bigger. I feel like I'm the information I'm giving you is a bit more, it's still anecdotal, but it's still dealing with a larger data set than what you guys have from personal experience, generally speaking, and bear that in mind. And Gary Tatum goes, as far as that goes, any part could fail. That's true too. From a CPU fan to the CPU, to the motherboard, uh, to the power supply, to the cables getting cracked or chewed through by a pet, or rodent. Oh, I've seen a bunch of stuff. I've seen, I've opened up routers and you open them up and they're covered in ants. And you're like, hmm, I think I know why this isn't working. And it's no fault of the manufacturer that you have a pest problem, right? That's again on the user side. I've seen people that never dust out their computers and they end up uh, having so much dust and debris inside of the computer that it causes a short circuit it actually can be conductive dust. It short circuits the system, and then they're all mad at the manufacturer when they did not properly maintain their computer. It's like never changing the oil in your car, and then you're angry that you blew your engine up after two or three years, or maybe even less than that, because you never changed the oil. The user has to be responsible or accept the consequences as their own fault. And I see that more then I see manufacturer defect. Let's say it's about 70, 30. About 70% of the time, it's a user problem that could have been avoided. And then 30%, it's just some weird fault that occurred. And again, and that 30% may not even be the manufacturer. It could be something that happened in shipping and then the problem just didn't show up until over time is you turn the machine on and turn it off and turn it on and turn it off and it heats up and it expands and it cools down and it contracts and it heats up and it expands and it cools down and it, it it contracts. So if you're turning your computer on and off and on and off and on and off, you will more than likely experience a problem long before somebody who just leaves a computer on. Refrigerators don't fail very often. Cell phones don't fail very often unless you drop them or spill something on them. And we leave these things on 24 seven. So if you want a machine to last as long as possible, leave it on. Unless it's a really small machine or a laptop where it has very tight air circulation. In those cases, I would advise you to shut it off at the end of the day, uh, but don't turn it on and off throughout the day. If you're done with it for a while, leave it on. If you're done with it for the day, shut it off. And I think that will improve the overall reliability and consistency of the, uh, of the perception you have of how well your computer is built. 
Does anybody have any questions about the EM680 that I can answer or we'll wrap up today's stream? Thank you to Fred Dobbs who contributed $5 in Super Chat. Bob R has now been a member for 13 months. Right on. Thank you, Bob. Happy 13th month anniversary to you, my friend. He says another month of great content. Hey, this month, we're not even halfway through it yet. And I've got uh, more videos than I can shake a stick at coming out here in the next couple of weeks. I just want people to have realistic expectations. I want you to know that your actions have consequences. And for you to blame your consequences from your actions onto the manufacturer or onto the software company is completely misguided and you're missing the plot. You're not getting it. And until you get that, you will likely keep repeating this over and over in your life and you're likely going to be upset more often, frustrated more often. You might feel that life is unfair and why does it only happen to you? It doesn't seem to happen to anybody else. That's the first place to start. I'm a computer technician. I get paid to fix things, whether the person screws it up, the manufacturer screws it up, delivery driver drop kicks it to the door. It doesn't matter to me. I'm paid the same. I am telling you, but nobody in my industry will tell you because they want you to break your computer. They want you to buy a new computer. They want to make money selling you more stuff for your computer that you don't need. They want you to break it. That's how they stay in business. Or they want you to feel like what you have isn't enough. You're not going to find that here on my channel. I'm going to tell it to you straight. Set your, be reasonable with your expectations. Use the equipment that you bought the way it was intended to be used, and you will be in an emotionally better place. You'll, you'll feel more stable. Life will feel like it's going smoother. <laughs> or don't. But either way, at least know what to expect based on that decision. And I'm happy to, to fix the problems. That if you get in over your head and did something I advise you not to do, and you did it anyway, and now you're stuck and you can't seem to find a way out of it, you can always reach out to me. I can have you send your computer to me and I can fix it for you. That's what you want to do. We can do it your way if you want to. But I don't think you're going to be happy about it. I don't think you're going to be happy shipping it to me. I don't think you're going to be happy being without it. And I don't think you're going to be happy with the price. Think about that. John Inglis says, thanks for the info today. Right on, John. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Richard Cullen joined us. I didn't see you in there earlier. Hey, Richard. Mark Gaines with another contribution, this time five pounds. He says, Carrie, talking about car accidents. My car was written off last week. I was rear-ended by a motorcycle. Holy cow. That must have hit you pretty hard. I have to imagine the motorcycle was probably written off. I mean, if that's what it did to the car, I can't imagine what it did to the, the rider. The car can be replaced. Hopefully you're okay. So once again, we're going to get ready to wrap up today's broadcast. So any questions about the EM680 or any other questions, I'll do my best to provide answers. It's, uh, what, been an hour and 40 minutes. I like to keep these at around two hours. So I'll stick around as long as you guys have questions. Uh, barring no questions, we'll wrap it up early. So you guys are going to decide the length of today's video, as you most often do. So primarily, questions related to the EM680. And then secondarily, any other questions. Do I know when the release date is? The end of the month is all they're saying. They will ship at the end of this month. John Williams says, Carrie, thanks for all you do and insight. Have a great night. Hey, John, thank you. You too, my friend. Have a good night.
I'm going to step away for a minute to give you guys time to write your question. I want to see what the mailman put in my garage. All right, more stuff for videos. Expecting to hear, you've got mail. All right, let's see if anybody asked any questions while I walked away. Jason wants to know, why have you gotten away from full-size desktops? Um, kind of burned out on it myself, kind of tired of it. I'm tired of the RGB, I'm tired of the liquid cooling. I never got into this business to do that nonsense waste of time. I didn't get into it for cable management. I didn't get into it for plumbing. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I don't like all the support calls and I don't like the cost of shipping keeps going up and up and up. I, I am just done with it. I will sell computers locally to people, but I don't want to ship them anymore with uh, a few exceptions. If they're mini PCs, I don't mind shipping them. There's less opportunity for damage and they're a lot cheaper to ship. But for local builds, for my clients, I still prefer to build them because I'm the one that's got to maintain them. And I would much rather maintain my own systems. I was at a client's last night from, gosh, I think I was there from 7 p.m. until 1 a.m. doing a bunch of solid state drive and RAM upgrades. And they were missing a bunch of Windows updates. And uh, I had to clone the data off of their budget NVMe drives over to some Samsung 970 Evos that are much, much faster, nearly twice the speed. And some of their machines had 16 gigs of RAM, but the price of RAM has come down so much that going to 64 gigs is like 125 bucks for two 32 gig team group modules. And it's like, you know, why don't we just bump these up? They've got like 12 computers over there. And I did five of them last night and there's still seven more to go. And I'm also going to put a two and a half gig network card into the main person's computer, along with a two and a half gig switch into their server room. And then I'm going to do the USB two and a half gig upgrade on their Synology because that user, that one user complains about how long their QuickBooks file takes to open over the network. So everybody else will keep them at one gig. And if the, if the employee that I'm doing this upgrade for like holy cow this is amazing then we will expand that to as many ports as we have on the switch which is an eight port switch they only have a dozen computers so obviously the nas will be taking up a port and that computer will take up a port and then the two and a half gig switch has to plug into the one gig switch so that's three ports taken that's going to leave us with five and that means five other employees in theory can attach to the two and a half gig switch that we've got if they think it's worth it. But I know for sure this one person will benefit from it because the employees all have different jobs. Some employees do, a, they do different work. So some employees will have multiple windows and multiple screens open all the time, and they're going to benefit from having a faster solid state drive and benefit from having more RAM, especially. So one of the clients had, you know, an Intel budget SSD with 16 gigs of RAM, and they, they're one of the top three power users of the place. And I was like, why did they give them this computer? They shouldn't have. They've got other computers that are better equipped. And they're all 9,700K processors that were built like three years ago. And changing the RAM is no big deal. I take the two RAM modules that are in it, pop those out, 
and replace them with the 232 gig modules. I don't try and match the RAM that's in there, and I only want to use two sockets. I don't want to use four, even though I have four available in all these builds. Just try to keep things simple. And um, it's cheap, it's really inexpensive. So I think that client's going to notice a significant difference today when they're in the office with regards to how responsive their computer is. So we will upgrade all of them to 64 gigs, whether they need it or not. Most of them probably don't need that, but it's so cheap, we might as well. And we're going to pull all those Intel budget NVMEs since they were sold to SK Hynix. And it's just the SSD prices and RAM prices have fallen so far. It doesn't make any sense to go with the budget drives anymore. So we're bumping everybody up to the, uh, the highest end of the Gen 3 that's reasonable, which in my opinion is the Samsung 970. That means we're pulling off the Intel NVMe driver and the Intel or slash Solidyne software tool, uninstall those. We put on Samsung Magician. We put on the Samsung NVMe driver and the Samsung Magician software has the data migration tool. So I don't have to use a Cronus. I can just use Samsung Magician to clone their Intel drive to their uh, new twice as fast Samsung drive. It takes about 15 minutes. All of these desktops are about 100 gigs, under 100 gigs average per desktop. All the files are saved on the NAS. So uh, still have a lot more work to do over there. I wasn't planning to stay there that late last night. And the client texted me this morning with a picture of her computer with the side panel off. I forgot, I was working on multiple machines at the same time. So while one was migrating uh, the data on another one, I was putting RAM in and then they, were, they all had BIOS updates, they're all gigabyte boards. So I was doing BIOS update on one, data migration on another, RAM upgrade on another. And I guess I was so loopy by the end of the day because remember, I had the errand to run yesterday. I did my members only video yesterday. And then I went to my clients and I was there five hours, six hours. And right at the end, I was wiped and I don't think I was thinking straight. And I forgot to put the side panel back, back on. I did all the work. I just forgot to put the panel and the two screws back on. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I guess I was getting loopy and they just laughed and said, it's not a big deal, but. I don't know what I was thinking. I had so many computers I was working on at the same time. And, you know, that's the main employee. That's the one that's the most power user of them all. And that's the one I left the cover off of. Pick myself. Iacovos Garakos said, I had a problem with VIP deals, never received my key. What is your email so I can send you the info? Well, first of all, what I advise people to do is reach out to the folks at VIP CDK deals. You know, they do not mail you your key. You do know this, right? You will get an email that confirms your purchase. And what you need to do is you go to VIP CDK deals and you log in with the account you created. You had to create an account in order to buy the key. So when you log into your account, you can see your purchases and you wanna look at that purchase for the key. You just, again, it's not emailed to you, it's in your account. So you log in, you look at your account setting and then right there, it'll say what your purchases were. And then, you know, say you bought Windows 10, it'll say, you know, Windows 10 with the date you bought it and how much you paid. And then you click a button that says view key or get the key. And then it shows you the key on the website. It is not mailed to you. Then you can highlight that with your mouse and hit control C to copy it and then paste it into notepad if you want to store it. Or what I'll do is I'll take a picture of it with my phone. I'll enter the key by looking at the picture. Once the key is activated, you'll never have to use that key ever again. It stays tied to that motherboard forever. So if you have any trouble with that, the very first step is to reach out to their customer service, which is right on their website. Look at the bottom of the page. Um, they even have a live chat you can do as well if it's during their operation hours, keeping in mind they're in a different time zone. And 99 times out of 100, they're going to sort that for you. 
if yours is that one out of 100 that it's not happening, then reach out to me and I will make it right. But don't come to me first. Go to them. A lot of times when people do this, it's the user that doesn't understand where they're supposed to get their key. And so sometimes we have a tutoring problem. So VIP CDK deals, uh, they'll tutor you, if assuming that's what the problem is, to show you where to locate your key. But um, I'm making some assumptions here because of in the past I've had people have a similar issue where they don't understand the process. Um, I don't know what happened here, but you want to have their customer service help you first. And only if their help is unacceptable or doesn't resolve your problem, either with a working key or a refund, then come to me and you will email me a copy of your receipt. I need your transaction number uh, and the date and what the product is you bought. And we go from there. But most people never need to contact me. Most people don't have a problem. And if in the rare occasion that they do, the folks at VIP CDK deals guarantee their keys. They have excellent customer support. You don't need to panic or worry. Everything's okay. But please, please give them an opportunity to correct either the misunderstanding, the miscommunication, or the problem. I'm not sure which of the three is, is what the issue is here. They will know better than I will. So please reach out to them, give them a chance, and they will likely make it right for you. If they don't, then please reach out to me and I will make it right for you, okay? Newsfan77 says, what partition is supposed to be active in a Windows 10 install using MBR? That's a weird question. Why are you asking that question? What are you doing? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Oystein in Norway says he's bought five or six keys from VIP CDK deals without a problem. I've bought probably six dozen product keys. Different versions of Office, Windows 10, Windows 11. Those are the only keys I buy. I don't buy any other software keys. I'm not playing games. But uh, I, I have occasionally run into a problem. I think out of the 60 plus keys I bought, two or three of them had an issue. And I just went to their live chat. I said, hey, this key isn't working. They want the transaction number. I give it to them. They want the key, I give it to them. They go, okay, here's a new key. It's really not a big deal. And if that was normal, I wouldn't buy my keys from them, but you know, three times out of 60, that's better than the odds I was getting, getting them from Microsoft. And I was paying a lot more money when I was buying them from Microsoft. And Bob R concurs. He says, yeah, VIP CDK deals has great customer service. They better because if I'm putting my name behind them, my reputation and my integrity behind a Cronus or RoboForm, Instant house call or VIP CDK deals, they better be up to my standards or I won't promote them anymore. It's not about money for me. It's about making sure I'm offering you guys a reliable quality service or product at a discounted price specifically for my audience that other people don't get. So you think about it if you were the company. Would you rather keep the customer happy, even if it means you have to cost you a little bit of money in rare circumstances? Or would you rather piss the customer off and jeopardize your relationship with me and lose all the future customers that you're going to get from me promoting your product? Which one of those things makes the most sense to proceed forward? So you can understand why it's in their best interest to take care of all of their customers. And they do. Newsvan said it was a hard drive backup and restore. I think it may have changed in process. Shouldn't have. So if you're doing an image backup, then it's going to back it up. Uh, and I don't know what you used to back. What software did you use to 
back up the computer, just out of curiosity. I've never done a system restore, uh, image restore, where I had to do anything to the partitions, ever. Whether I was using a Cronus or the Samsung migration tool or uh, the one I don't like, Macrium Reflect. He used Aomi. Eh, no, I can't speak for that one. That I don't know. Honestly, I don't know the answer to the question because it's a very unusual question, but it would be my assumption that it automatically gets set. So either you backed up wrong or you restored wrong. And, or you did everything correctly, but you have another problem. And you're guessing as to which partition is active. Um, you should be able to Google that, though, I would think. And I would also reach out to Aomi's tech support. If you're using a piece of software that isn't working, and, and, and I don't understand why people do this, because I won't. I absolutely have a, a principle that I stand on. If I've bought a product, and that product doesn't work the way it's supposed to, I'm not going to ask somebody else how to fix it. I'm going to the people that took my money, and I'm going to say, make this right or give me my money back. And that's how I would handle it if I were you. Gary Tatum said, I used Aomi once and I destroyed two operating systems at the same time. I don't know anything about the Aomi uh, tool, so I don't, I don't use it. Newsfan said, the system boots okay. I just think it changed. I wanted to know what the standard is. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know. I mean, if anybody knows the answer to that question, uh, that newsfan is asking about which partition is typically the active partition on a Windows 10 with MBR. I don't know. John Williams says, Carrie, thanks for the live stream. CDK deals are awesome. Time to eat dinner and good night. Hey, John, thank you again for hanging out with us today. Um, the other thing you can do if you want to answer this question on your own is do a fresh clean installation of Windows 10, and then take a look at the partitions yourself, and then restore your backup again, and then compare the two. And then that way you don't have to take anybody's word for anything. Mark Leibowitz recommends uh, you can solve the problem like this by simply using your Windows installation media and instead of running the install, you run the repair button. So there you go. Okay, we're just about three o'clock, so I guess we're gonna wrap it up. I don't see any other questions. I'll just run through real quick. Bradley Morris said, today is patch Tuesday for Windows updates. Is today the second Tuesday of the month? Oh, I suppose it would be. Is that right? How many Tuesdays have we had this month? Two or three. June 6th was our first Tuesday, and June 13th is our second Tuesday. Yes, that is correct. It is Windows Update Patch Tuesday of the month today. It will happen automatically, or you can just click on the gear icon, go to Settings, hit Windows Update, and force it to the update. You don't want to wait for it to happen in time on its own. Thanks for the reminder. Richard Collins said he's still in the hospital. He's watching from his hospital bed. Thanks for the live show shows. They help the boring time I have. Well, Richard, I'm hoping you're healing and getting better. And if I can distract you a few hours of the day, well, uh, I'm, I'm happy to have that job, if you will. I'm, I'm happy to fill that role for you. I will be back live tomorrow at 1 o'clock, Thursday at 1 o'clock, and Friday at 1 o'clock. It's all mini PCs this week as we explore the, see, we've got the Morphine M9. We've got the Chewy Larkbox X. And then we've got the Minis Forum NAD9 on Friday. Have some more after that, but that's going to finish off this week. 
And I hope you'll join me then as we explore the options that exist in this amazing world that has developed. I, I never saw this coming, the, the, the invasion of the mini PCs. And I love the choices in the selection. I think it's just awesome. Everything from budget boxes to mid-range to high-end content creation machines in a much smaller, more portable form factor. It's welcome in my world. I'm very much looking forward to reviewing them. We'll do more giveaways very soon. I know I keep promising that, but I have to get this work done first. We've got more of the middle mini HPs to give away. And um, I might give away some of the other mini PCs as well, but I'm going to go through the mini HPs first. I think we have about 20 of those still sitting around here. And I hope to get to those next week or the week after, but we'll see as time permits. And I think that'll wrap it up. So my thanks again to everybody who has contributed during today's show. And that includes, of course, Mark Gaines, Fred Dobbs. Fred contributed $5 earlier. I think I missed it. Thank you, Fred. Thank you to Bob R. Troll McTrollington. Oystein contributed 100 Norwegian Krona. Oh my goodness. Uh, I think, is that like $25, 25 US dollars? Oystein continues to contribute in Norwegian money, which is so, yeah, I see that NOK and I'm like, that's really cool. Uh, 100, I'm just curious, 100 NOK to USD. Hey, what happened to the kroner? Did it go down in value? It's $9.38, man. Still, nothing to shake a stick at. And I appreciate it very much, Oystein. Oystein's been very generous to the channel, by the way, and continues that generosity with today's Super Chat. Thank you also to Steve H. and to... Did I say Paul O'Brien? If not, thank you to Paul O'Brien. Thank you goes out to Darren Belmore. Remember to reach out to me. We can further that discussion privately. Um... Planet Cryos. Oh, I've got Planet Cryos' videos coming out this weekend, too. Davis Parsons continued his membership, as did Icaranis. Thank you to Paul M. for your Super Chat contribution. I don't see him today, but a shout out to our good friend Peter Laycock. I'm sure he'll be watching this later. Thanks to Phil at Miniswarm for continuing to keep us under consideration for their new releases so that we can continue to review them and we can do so with integrity and honesty with no signed contracts. I'm not obligated to say anything. I'm not making any money from Miniswarm. Quite the opposite. I just paid for the NAD9, okay? So I genuinely like their products that I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And uh, thank you to Camera Girl, who's not here today, but for the amazing thumbnail that she made for today's video. And then I'll check email one more time to see if I'm forgetting anybody here. I think we're covered. All right. So that'll wrap it up for me for today. All the links for the UM680, if you want to be one of the first to own one, order it now. You get a cheaper price. And as soon as they ship later this month, you'll be one of the first to have one. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. They're amazing little boxes. It's hard to believe they put that much power in that small of a space. And further, it's hard to believe it's whisper quiet. It's crazy. All right. And uh, let's see. Let me find an outro here, and I can officially wrap up today's broadcast. I think we'll do that one right there. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all again tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Until then, bye for now.